Welcome guys to the MMOs.com podcast. This is Altai here with episode 64 and I am joined this week by... Omer. Gumble. Shirelia. And that and is it. We are a, yeah. we have one AFK, as you can see there in the overlay if you're watching live on Twitch. Matt is on vacation and he shall be back next week. And uh, there is a lot of things you want to get to this week. I know probably a lot of people are interested in hearing about the BDO pay to win issues. But before we get to that, we're going to throw it to Gumby. We're going to start by playing hearted. Start off a little lighthearted. Easy and then we're going to get right into the frustration of the BDO. Uh, I actually don't know about it, so this is going to be oh, great. interesting. Oh, great. Anyway, before we get there, the weekly raid. This week we're talking PvP. PvP. And we're asking how important is PvP in an MMORPG? So, me, myself, I think I've said this before, I'm a huge fan of open world PvP. I love when I'm on a priest collecting my morning glory seeds, just minding my own business. When out of nowhere, my character looks like they had a brain aneurysm because some rogue just shanked them in the liver, <laughs> typing keek again and again and again. Uh, I think it's great, actually, when I go to judge a game, uh, whether or not I stick with the game, uh, whether it has longevity for me, is dependent on whether or not there's open world PvP, because I love spontaneous interactions. Mm -hmm. Now, other players, maybe they look for uh, arenas, they need some type of arena, some type of competitive atmosphere to test their might, or a battleground. Uh, some players don't like PvP at all, and uh, they just are interested in the PvE experience, and therefore they hate open world PvP. And this can be very game-dependent, contextually. Mm -hmm. Dependent. So I'm curious what everyone around here thinks and what everyone in the chat thinks about PvP. All right. We should we should go in order of the our call out our name name call out. That's okay. a good plan. So who's like first? That. Is that my first? You're first. Yeah. All right. Take here we go, away. boys. My take: If you're gonna play an MMORPG rather than like an Overwatch style game, it's gotta be open world. The arena is secondary to me. All right. It's it's really about that persistent world and fighting there, right? Working together, the, the emergent gameplay, the allies you make on the field, the enemies you make on the field are more important than the ones you make, uh, like, you queue with or random queue people for, like, five minutes. And I know my brother probably disagrees with that because he likes the fairness and structure of arenas more because you can prove who's better <laughs> Don't or assume other people All right, all right, all right. I'll let him talk for himself. Yeah. Go. All right. Uh, first of all, I do want to say open world PvP is amazing in a lot of games. If you think back at your most memorable and more RPG experiences, I know for, I could probably speak for all time myself, is games like World of Warcraft and Ultima Online. Games where you can be minding your own business and you <laughs> can get ganked and you can just get fucked, all right? Just, even if you're the one getting ganked, right? As Gumble was saying in his example, he likes getting ganked. I'm, sure he, that, he, I'm sure he meant that because he got ganked, it feels like an, you know, an, emergent, an immersive world, and he knows he could do that to somebody else. So right. the games that were most memorable to me are Ultima Line and World of Warcraft in that you had those spontaneous, you know, events basically where you just you fight other people, you're in a dungeon minding your own business, you can get you know, you can gank, you can gank other people. There's a real sense of danger. And however, I do like the structure of arena PvP as well. I think a game should have both. I feel like you lose nothing by adding an arena PvP to a game where you want to, you know, cuz you know, whoever you know, a lot of PvP in Ultima Line and World of Warcraft came down to the, just being with friends and ganking people, and ganking really got popular because of the. It really that term became huge in Ultima and, and you know World of Warcraft. But you got to find out who the best is. The game should have a system in place for that. And I gotta wave my dick around in an MMO because that's that's why you play an MMO to wave that dick around. Right. You heard it here first, folks. You play an MMO to wave your dick around. Please, Australia, take it away. She can't wave her dick around though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well. My reason for, I, I actually agree, I, I really like open world PvP, and I think it's because, for me, one of the worst things in MMOs is the feeling of it being stagnant, of me just grinding away, doing something, like, mm -hmm. monotonous, right? And I feel like PvP really adds a lot of ex excitement into the mix, because not only, like like Gumby said, like, you know, you're you're doing something monotonous, but there's always, like, that chance that, like, something might just happen, you know? And I feel like a lot of MMOs are kind of that don't have this kind of miss that aspect for me. And I get really bored when I play, like when I'm doing the grinding. I mean, this is like raids aside, right? This is just the leveling experience yeah. for me in the open world. Um, just like the sudden, like, you know, thrill of like, you know, you're getting ganked or like, you know, you go over a hill and you see like, oh, there's a bunch of, there's like two reds down there. Like, can we fuck them up? Let's like scout them out, you know? Mm -hmm. like, that kind of like interaction that just like happens spontaneously, I think it adds a lot to not only the immersion, the the world feeling like dynamic, but it just adds a lot of excitement to kind of offset the monotonous grind. I think so. That's why I think it's a healthy thing. 
I mean, there's a lot of um, counter arguments to people saying like, well, I get camped and, and whatnot. But again, like Alte said, I feel like that also adds a lot of um, interactions between players, right? Like, I mean, happens, I mean, I mean, has this ever happened in your career where you've been getting camped by someone you like type in like the faction chat and you're like, hey guys, there's like a bunch of fucking campers here, campers here. like, please help me out, right? And then they mm -hmm. come, you become friends with those guys and... And, and there's even times where I've gotten messaged by the other team, like the other faction on like another account. And they're like, GG, man. Like, you know, like if you had like a big, huge duel, I've had that happen to me in World of Warcraft where mm -hmm. me and like another guy, like just went back and forth for like an hour. We just kept ganking each other. And then he messaged me and we were like talking and then, you know, we, we became cool after that. And you don't have that in MMOs. A lot of MMOs that don't have that aspect are a lot of tunnel visual visioning the content and you don't really get to experience like the multiplayer aspect of it. Yeah. So sorry, that was kinda of long, but I want to throw out something we mentioned too. I think a big part of PvP and MRPGs is it adds like it makes it adds value to the grind. Because you know, when you're grinding, I don't think anyone's having fun just repetitively killing that monster. That's not but fair. you know but no, you get just getting the higher level, getting the better gear, reaching endgame, getting better gear at the end empowers your character in the only real persistence that I would say like has an overarching lasting effect is your PvP strength. Well, that, Gain the best you, yeah. gear after, go ahead. How do you explain games like MapleStory then? Again, it is on a per game basis. Yes. A game like MapleStory is well, much, well, less much more casual, I would say, even though you can uh, still take time into it. Casual? Uh, you see, um, we, we play like eight hours a day. So that's, that's not exactly casual. How much I mean, you let, me, let, me, let me defend Omer for a second on this. Okay. Like, I think it's a varying degree of the same thing that Omer is saying. So, like, you still have the big dick syndrome based on, like, your gear and, like, how cool your character looks. Mm -hmm. Whereas Omer is talking about a more visceral, like, I kill visceral. you, I'm better than you type of a thing, right? It, it's still the same thing. But... Omer's version is like you can feel it, you know what I mean, rather than just see it. I think everyone enjoys having like, a, like even though your character gets stronger, right, and you have better gear, but like you can't really show that to anyone unless it, like it doesn't mean anything to anybody else unless it's like you you can fight him. Imagine like League of, like in any MMORPG, if this guy's got the best possible gear, but like there's zero way to, for you to interact with him, it doesn't really matter what he has. But in a game with open PvP, you look at someone's gear like holy shit, he's got that sword that's like. This much damage is legendary sword. I want this shit now. And like all of a sudden you really want it because you know he's got it and he can PvP with it and just do all this cool stuff. Whereas okay, he can he can he can kill that raid boss slightly faster than I can. Who cares? Uh, but that's not I don't think it's required. Like you don't need like to have the best open world PvP in the game to be successful. I just yeah, I want to see it in my game. I think it is important to point out that when we say MMORPG, when I have a vision of what I mean by open world PvP and MMORPG, I'm thinking of like the archetype, right? The WoWs, the Arc Ages, the lineages. Because there are, you know, it is contextually defined, doesn't work as well in a game like Maple Story. And it's not it's not game breaking. That's another thing to point out. I don't know if anyone else thinks it's game breaking. You know, if a game doesn't have PvP but you not play it, I, I, I don't think anybody would say that since we all played Maple Story. Um, but when it's there, it's just it's an added bonus. And like Shu, I think it was Shu said it breaks up the. Or Omar, I think you might have said it breaks up that the monotony if you get stuck in it. It, it makes it also adds a, an element, and we're only talking about open world PvP, so it's a bit unfair. Uh, but you have there's a there's a, an element of surprise, an element of um, the unexpected. You're always like in Stranglethorn Vale and Vanilla, you're always like looking over your shoulders. You know, where's that rogue gonna pop out of? Um, yeah. Will any of you not play a game? Go ahead. Will any of you not play a game because there's no PvP? No. It depends how it depends how yeah. good the game is. Like like. I think that Final Fantasy, um, Final Fantasy's um, what do you call it? Content is good enough to not. Yeah, I agree. To be okay without having it, but I don't like. I wouldn't play WoW without it. Yeah. Like, for example, yeah, I... like. I really like the way WoW kind of handled it because with the with the recent changes coming, what probably already happened with the Legion patches, is that they're actually making their gear not as important in arena PvP. So you still have that structured experience. However, with the world PvP, you still, which is again not a huge part of the game, I think there's only one or two servers with a decent amount of Horde and Alliance on the same server. But with world PvP, your gear still matters. So you still have that sense of like added context to your progression. Like getting just the best possible gear and just doing slightly more damage to a raid boss at a certain point, I feel like it doesn't have the same effect as knowing that your character is just permanently stronger or just has more capability against other players in that world. 
Obviously, you still a... need to get better gear to clear the next dungeon. There's a, that, that sense of progression is very important. I don't want to downplay that at all. Because I've a lot a... of the content in WoW has not been completed by most people. All right. I have an observation. Like, do you guys feel that because there was open world PvP, it really fueled this, um, what do you call it? Um, this loyalty to faction? Because, like, you, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen this anywhere else, but with World of Warcraft, it was very, like, for the Horde or for yeah. the Alliance. It was very, there was so much merch. There was so much, like, just, they really hyped it up, like, those those sides. Like, are you Horde or Alliance? And then, like, mm -hmm. people put it on their car. People like, you know, fuck you, you're, you're Horde Alliance or whatever. Scum, yeah. for the Horde. Alliance scum, right? You, I mean, all of that would not have existed without the open world PvP, I don't think. It would have been to that same level. Like, that, it just adds so much that, like, they're constantly attacking your cities, and you're like, fuck those guys, and then, like, let's mm -hmm. fuck their city up, and, you know, like, it, it, I mean, I don't know, I only played up to, to, to Wrath, really, and I remember back then it was a lot of, like, especially with, like, Terran Mills and, like, whatever that mm -hmm. place is. Terran Mills, yep. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that place was, like, infamous Dustwood. back then, right? It yep. was, like, that's where you came back when you were high level, you know, to, like, defend, you know, you, you paid it back, you know? You paid back uh, all that ganking that happened to you when you're a I little. I want to talk a little baby, about the difference you know? between um, battlefields, right, battlegrounds, and persistent world. Sure. And I could, okay, I think our best experiences, I think everyone here across the board is open world, right? Yeah, yeah, for us personally. The, the sure. emergent gameplay allows you know interesting, interesting events. Even if mm -hmm. you have fun with arena, it's not interesting. Like it's not sticky. Um, and to that, there's a, I think there's other benefits to battlegrounds over uh, to persistent world over battlegrounds. And that is, with open world, individual balance is less important. Here's what I mean. Like, if you, if you and your friend are ganking in WoW, you're not going to pick t exactly two people your level, right? Yeah. And gank them. They're going to be no. slightly underleveled, maybe even slightly overleveled, but they're going to be fighting a mob. Too. They're gonna be, yeah, yeah. The gear's going to be different. The mobs, are gonna, the fighting are going to be different. You're going to get to jump on them, so that, that's going to make a difference, right? So, mm -hmm. there's more leeway for the developer to not have to perfectly balance everything. Whereas in a that's game like right. Blade and Soul, if everything is not almost perfectly balanced, you can get bitch fest on the forums, hundred percent. And, and that yeah, true. see, like, sure, I was thinking of you when I said. That. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so rather than work on new content, interesting content, you know, they gotta they gotta spend all this time balancing every class for every other class, every ability, every yeah. new ability has to be balanced for every other ability, and how it interacts, right? And I think it takes a lot more time than I guess many players might realize, right? And it's just more time away from actual new content. Well, that's true. Yeah. I mean. Again, games like wow, you know, when you're ganking somebody else, it's perfect balance is relevant. Ultima line, same thing. And with the emerging gameplay, I want to just give another example of why I, I really enjoyed the emerging gameplay in Ultima Online. My brother and I could be spending like two hours farming liches in uh in Deceit, which is a dungeon in the game. You know, we're, we're doing our own business, we're just farming, we're killing the stuff, and all of a sudden, like three people just poured in, right? From these and they got the red names. We instantly try running away, they're on mounts, they catch us. And they kill us. So they basically make us waste this like hour and a half of time. And they kill us. They loot everything we have and they leave. And that sense of like danger. So you always have to kind of weigh your like, should I hunt in this dungeon where it's really fast gold, but there's a high risk of getting ganked and jumped by murderers? Or I can go somewhere safer, right? Which is less efficient. And just having these options and these, this, this, always this constant threat really elevates the game to more than just like going somewhere and just doing something and grinding, which I feel like so many games have kind of fallen in the trap of. Where a lot of games, you know, nowadays don't even have open PvP. It's always been okay. consensual with duels. You know, even older Korean free to play moments had like lineage two and stuff. You can just attack players, you can just PK them. You 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 really lost that in newer games, I would say. And it really takes away from the just that sense of shit can happen at any time. And of course you can be on the reverse side of that as well. And there's of course, you know, when you're hunting somebody as a murderer, it's not all just griefing. There's penalties for getting for killing people too. It's not like I we endorse a game where just unbridled killing and griefing and there's pros and cons to both sides but it's you don't see that in a lot of newer games maybe it's just me being old and hearkening to the good old days of, of ultima online but it's i think all of them battlegrounds open world arenas they all serve a purpose and when mm -hmm. you have all of them in one game that's you know that's a feature complete pvp experience and then whatever else you have and, and i actually do like all three i think what makes open world and why we're talking about it so fondly most memorable is that it wasn't expected and it was that unexpected and you know it was that those unexpected interactions between players that make them interesting but at the same time i had tons of fun playing ultra Egg valley for hours all day and trying my best in arenas and ff14 and losing miserably uh it's just it's just a matter of what kind of narrative are you yourself creating as you play and that's why open world i think stands out
Uh, you know, um, going back to what Alte said too about imbalance, I feel like that adds a different type of experience in a sense that like some of my biggest memories of playing like like World of Warcraft are like those cases where you get ganked, you're outgunned, outmanned, and you still kill them. Like <laughs> those are like the biggest like 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 I've like jumped out of my chair and screamed just like you know <laughs> yeah. out of like you know I mean I'm sure that's happened for you yeah. before. Yep, like, definitely, that definitely. is like that is like I think the highest like rush you could get in a video game. Mm -hmm. Like like it has never been higher than that for me. And, and you know, I mean, I'm gonna be honest. That might be why I kind of play weird stuff. I think, <laughs> I, I think, I think I'm searching for that that rush again. Sure. Because <laughs> like every yeah. time I play, I play on a, in Overwatch, and like I win against like a Genji. It's like I feel that you know, like you just got fucked, you know, and like I don't know. Well, like then you can kind of subtly prove my point that I think balance is highly overrated, and in fact, it's imbalance. Overcoming Im overcoming imbalance is is, is the interesting part. And oh, rewarding, uh, yeah. yeah. It's the it's a shonen anime effect. Yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> sticky. It's a sticky. It's a sticky feeling. Like, I don't know. I, that's what it's all about. Like honestly, you know, oh, we were outnumbered. Like even in Rust, right? Like imagine you're in your house and there's two of you in the house and there's like eight guys outside and you somehow overwhelm the odds yeah. with bow and arrows and they have guns. You know, you peek, you shoot once. You peek, you shoot once. It's those kind of events that's really stick with us. That's true. To be able to take down a guy with a gun in Rust, like the, the most satisfying feeling. You got a bow, oh, you absolutely. just start out, and you kill a guy with a, with a rock somehow, because like he's just just keeps missing, and you just you just nail him. It's so satisfying. I, I remember we, we we played and you did that for being non-meta in League. She plays mid uh mid Leona. She plays all these absurd non-meta picks just to relive that experience of you know. It might winning. be why actually now that I, I was like thinking about it, like while we're talking about it, and I'm like, mm -hmm. man, is that is that why I'm like that? I, I guess so. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of balance, I think this is a good launching point mm -hmm. to move into our heaviest topic of the day. A topic I, I, I'm not looking forward to, actually, just because we I feel like we've drained it. And that is the recent scandal. Not scandal. scandal. The recent outrage surrounding Black Desert Online and our controversy of the week. Uh, so for those of you who don't know it, I guess I'll take it away unless someone else mm -hmm. wants to. Uh, Black oh, Desert yes. Online... Uh, has been riddled with controversy since it first launched. People proclaimed pay to win due to cash shop items providing small bonuses, and we had a lengthy discussion at launch. But now it's back in the news for more pay to win shenanigans, or at least oh perceived boy. pay to win shenanigans. Uh, so to explain what's going on here, recently, Black Desert Online or Cacao Games, previously known as <laughs> Dom Games, allowed Cacao. Pearl Cacao. Cacao! <laughs> it's fun to say. They allowed uh, pearl items, which means cash shop items, to be sold on the in-game marketplace. Something that was initially removed from the rest of Western release of the game compared to the rest of the world in order to balance it and prevent any conception of pay to win. At the same time, uh, a couple weeks ago, I believe uh, a value pack was introduced to the game, which is essentially a monthly subscription that provides uh, numerous bonuses, including um less taxes on items you put on the marketplace now uh there has been quite an outrage an outpouring of rage uh, because of these changes mainly the allowance of pearl items on the marketplace because uh theoretically you could imagine somebody who has an infinite number amount of money they could go to the cash shop buy items put them on the marketplace and accumulate an infinite amount of in-game currency and the reason why that's important is that black desert online's end game is predicated on farming uh, for items to increase the power of your gear. Uh, rather than doing dungeons, because the game doesn't have a robust PvE experience, you increase the power level of your gear, essentially, by farming these items and buying items in the marketplace, selling items in the marketplace, and then buying them uh, allows you to circumvent all that grind. Let me let me clarify very quickly, too. Go ahead, silver is, is the game's currency. And it plays silver, a, correct. It plays an enormous role in your character's yes. strength. Essentially, the more silver you have, the more power you have. Because you can through the game's RNG upgrade system, you need more and more silver to get your weapon a higher and higher level. And by being able to sell your goods in the auction, uh, be, being able to uh, just sell premium items in the auction house, you can essentially buy silver indirectly. So they're facilitating an indirect system where you can buy silver. And in a lot of games, I would say this isn't a problem because most of the gear in a lot of MMORPGs are kind of like buying down equipped. You get them through dungeons, so it's not really always a big deal. But in a game like Black Desert Online, you are really just straight up buying silver equals power. And if you can buy silver indirectly, that's where you're buying power, and that's where the controversy comes from. So there have been a number of people 
uh, on the forums who claim they've been banned for complaining about this. Those are so allegations. Banned for complaining? Banned from the yeah, forums I, or banned from the game? Banned from the forums. forums okay, for okay, 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 okay. Uh, and many people have written lengthy posts about it. Um, the Lazy Peon, who's a famous YouTuber, put out a very emotional and, uh, and out there rant. I have to say, I don't think any of us still play Black Desert online. I think many of us kind of... Uh, I, I, I rated the game. I actually really enjoyed Black Desert. I'm sure I still would. But the experience faded over time. Uh, just um, for no real reason, just moving from game to game. But I did enjoy mm -hmm. it. So, of course, we need to discuss whether or not all of this uh, outpouring, this outcry against Black Desert uh, is, is warranted. Um, warranted. Yeah. And uh, just my initial thought is this. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't want to get into the definition of uh, what pay to win means because that's going to take us off track, but um, it may come up on the periphery. Well, but it does feel disingenuous, right? When Black Desert Online was launched in the West, they launched as a buy to play title to avoid any notion of pay to win. And they've been kind of creeping towards these practices, which are typically seen as pay to win over a couple of months. Now, I know Omer predicted it would go. Uh, free to play. play and it's funny these practices are typical to a free to play game but this mm -hmm. is a buy to play game and play hold up it. hold up didn't they also add a subscription they also added a subscription it's called the value pack so Correct. are people complaining about is it is this part of the controversy or, or is that just yeah, it, is, okay. part it is part of the controversy but the pearl items selling pearl items in the marketplace is what kind of ignited it's the biggest deal the dino yeah okay. and it's just kind of it's it's added up it was a stacking right. i, I want to admit you specifically get a pretty big bonus for the value pack you get a 30 yeah, percent reduction me... in taxes paid correct correct Taxes on the marketplace, right? The auction. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's all about making more money because, yeah. again, money money is what fuels your ability to progress in this game. The more zenny you have, the more powerful your gear. So, sounds like a pretty it's... realistic uh, virtual world to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like real life. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know that's gonna be that's Altai's argument that this is you know it's, it's like real life. Real life is pay to win. But here's where the biggest controversy arises. I mean, honestly, these actions in and of themselves. Are honestly pretty predictable i think most of us can see stuff like this creeping on a game but really where people are rightfully pissed off is the fact that before the game launched there was numerous interviews with at that point they were called dom games or cacao games now saying specifically they weren't going to do any pay to win stuff and they don't like pay to win stuff right but again that's pay to win again is a term that's it could mean anything you know so they could still say they live by their definition however they specifically said there would be no subscription Specifically for like ad items, <laughs> they, said they, they said they wouldn't do it, right? And here they are, literally back. They, they got caught in a very specific lie. Before they could have avoided the lie simply by saying, you know, you know, pay to well, win. It's, it's an optional. It's an optional subscription, though. Yeah, of course. But they said they weren't going to give you value uh, items through a subscription. Oh. Okay. And that was the, the, the on that note, they kind of got they kind of you know, they were, lies were told, and you can argue a lot of people actually bought the game because of their pre-release uh, interviews saying this is our philosophy. And we're going to follow this system where we're not going to give any pay to win stuff. And they were trying to like, we're only ever going to sell convenience. And people bought the game for that. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the pre-orders were driven by players who had that, you know, who, who bought it for that reason. And again, I'm not ready to skewer these guys yet. I know, I know a lot of people are upset, but a lot of these changes are almost like predictable too. Like, All right. the I have, cat, yeah, go ahead. I have two defenses. Please. One, is, Please, one is annoying, frustrating defense. Hmm. And one is a very pragmatic defense. Which one would you like to hear first? <laughs> you you give us the order you think. Uh, which, which which one's gonna stick more? That's the one you should do last. What, whichever you're more passionate about. Yeah, okay. which one are you more, are you right. more first passionate up, about? First up, first up, first up. I'll do the annoying one. Okay, that can sure, go in circles okay. if you guys don't stop me. Okay. Ready? Please don't go in circles. All right. So they're adding a feature that was in the original version, the Korean version, right? So this is the way yes. the game was meant to be played. This is the way it was developed. Sure. Okay. Two. A lot of other games do have a very similar feature, including older games like Neverwinter. You could buy and sell. Uh, Blade and Soul as well. Blade and Soul also, which you guys are loving on. Um, so I don't see the... Uh, oh, by the way, those are both... Well, one is well, one is owned by China. One is actually another Korean game. So, yeah. what? why the hate on this game for a feature that's been around for years Very now? Very simple. Like five years. Black Desert Online in America and the West is not free to play. They said we're making it buy to play so we can avoid the issues that Koreans have with the game. The game is a complete failure in Korea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, People it is. People are saying it's a complete true. failure because of the pay to win elements. And, there's, and basically, people begged the publisher in America, right, don't do the same mistakes. The game is cool. Don't make the same mistakes the Korean developers and publishers made. So please don't make it pay to win. And they said basically, okay, we heard the complaints. We don't want to make, we don't want to devolve into the same nonsense that happened in Korea. So we're going buy to play, and we're not going to have a subscription. We're going to make it not pay to win. 
all these wonderful promises were made. Okay, second, second, that's de- why people are second defense now. This is this pragmatic one that you can't argue with. Silver bullet okay. and the revolver. Ready? All right, Boom. let's hear it. That's what they wanted to do. They tried it. It didn't work. They sold a lot of copies, right? Mm-hmm. And like everyone, like us, people stopped playing. So, yeah. so the money, the money stopped rolling. Yeah, in. yeah, that's true. Now, when the stop, money stops rolling in uh, from box sales, you know, well, digital like copies, mm-hmm. right? What what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to sit there and just go like not get any more money? No, they're like, what? Well, let's let's copy the original, you know, microtransaction model and make some money here. So they tried it your way, right? They tried it the way they they yeah, wanted okay. to try it. It didn't work. Uh, they sold boxes and that's it. Unfortunately, here's where I'm going to say you're right. That 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 is what happened, and the problem is with the business model. I mean, when you launch a game by to play, I I always feel like when like. People have, you know, praised Guild Wars. They actually pulled it off decently well. The whole buy to play once, play forever model. But every time, I feel like when a game launches buy to play, they're going to make a lot of money up front. And you know, Black Desert Online made a lot of money up front. They sold hundreds of thousands of copies of the game. But when the money dries up, and it's bound to dry up because again, after the initial wave dies down, people start quitting. Less people start buying. They really can't support their operations. You know, they have employees. They have to keep the game running. There's a cost to it, right? Even though they made like a couple million dollars up front, you know. Some of that would be banked for profit, and then they got to keep the rest for operating expenses. And with, at, at any point when the game's revenue is not covering its expenses, they're losing money, they will adjust and tinker until they make more money than they lose. And that's why they end up doing this. But yeah. still, like, business model. like, having a side subscription model that, like, kind of segregates your your user base, like, for power, I mean, that's a problem. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of other ways you could do it. I mean... You know, like like Guild Guild Wars, for example, right? Like they mm. they have a lot of convenience items, but they don't really sell like actual. I mean, I I don't know how it is now, but like mm-hmm. before, it didn't really have that, right? So so they could sell an expansion. Yeah, that's true. Well, yeah, you're getting you're getting whole new contents still... for free. Uh, content yeah, for yeah, free. But, 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 but yeah, what are you saying though? Is like there shouldn't be an update in between the expansion and now? They like need to have like consistent money in order to keep the game going, right? Mm-hmm. But that's why I think Altai's point earlier about a, a well-designed cash shop is important in a game like Black Desert Online. I mean, you, they, they clearly took it too far, broke promises, and there's got to be a better balance between being able to sell power of some sort and being able to make money and being able to make it, you know. I think people would not have complained. This would not be as big of a deal if they didn't say early on that they weren't going to sell power they, they said they weren't going to be paid to pay to win they this there would be no subscription if they didn't make those promises and the game launches free to play i really don't think anybody would complain about these changes that's a different a different issue that's an yeah, okay. issue of integrity the most important issue yes. the most important issue now is where does the game go from here is it, does it have a brighter future because of this uh or is it just going to wither and die and there's a good example of a game that went from subscription to free to halfway and that's star wars the old republic mm-hmm. uh Started subscription, tanked after a month, after the box sales, right? Mm-hmm. And went free to play, but it kept the subscri- optional subscription, which basically was super like required, yeah, right? Like super. Rest- you know, if you play for free, you could play for free, but you were you were hamstrung so hard. And by that yeah. I mean you only had one um, hot bar. If you wanted the additional hot bars, like on the left and right, okay. You, so t- to use two thirds of your abilities, you you had to be a subscriber. <laughs> but even that feels more genuine than like. It- it just, I feel like it's such an insult to players to be able to just pay for... I mean, clearly, this, the pay-to-win... Again, we, we don't really... Just, everyone has no definition of pay-to-win, right? But yeah, selling power the pay in the game win. has such like a negative connotation. It, is, it infuriates players. Even like... There was actually a really good comment. Maybe Sean wants to talk about it on MOS.com. So he left on the article saying most of the players complaining are just casuals anyway. And they were never in the running to be yeah. like the most competitive players. But that stigma of pay-to-win just infuriates players, even if they're like... Even if they're not good at the game, or they're not, you know, really taking it seriously, like it, it just really frustrates players in the West. And I've, a game like Star Wars, um... they nickel and dimed you, but they didn't sell power. You know, they sold you every every like adventure costs money. Like you need a subscription that, or, or you get the subscription and you can get them all for you know that way. But it didn't sell power, and WoW and stuff they don't sell power. And I think people are, you know, going back to those games for that reason. Like WoW was getting a resurgence because people, okay, the, people realize, okay, Blizzard's not going to screw us, all right. We might not like all the content Blizzard makes, but they're never going to go full asshole and just start selling power. And that's why WoW has been a steady winner. Oh, they have a subscription. Thing. They don't need to sell power. Exactly. And it, it goes back to the, the point of, is buy-to-play versus free-to-play versus subscription? What is the ultimate model? And there, there are pitfalls for buy-to-play and free-to-play. There's pitfalls for all of them, obviously, but... But just I mean, buy-to-play is all really three. the worst. 
Well, just do what WoW does, all three of them. Yeah, it costs money. True. The box costs money. There's a monthly subscription and there's microtransactions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it prevents them. It keeps players happy because they know once you pay the subscription, nobody's gonna be able to pay for power, and, and it keeps most people pretty happy about it. But what free to play usually is designed with you know the longevity of the game in mind, and if designed well, it could work. The problem with buy to play is expectations are so much different when the game is buy to play. When you buy, when you bought Black Desert Online, you were you bought it with a promise that they were gonna do this and this, right? And you feel entitled. However, with free to play, you feel like you invest the time, but you, you know. You, you're not really entitled to anything because all you do is invest time. Whereas you invest money in a buy-to-play game, you expect things to work the way they promised it would work. And I feel like buy-to-play is open to the most pitfalls for that reason, in my opinion. You know what's funny is, uh, yeah, like you were saying, if they, if they hadn't made these initial promises, if it wasn't hyped up as being this egalitarian mm -hmm. game, this game where everyone's on equal grounds, we're not going to follow these other practices, there would not be this blow-up controversy with people making videos where they say, fuck this game, mm -hmm. over and over and over again. And I'm not even sure, you know, if it's, you know, blatantly pay to win, right? But um, it, 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 what this is, this is a PR disaster. Yes. This is, this is you not communicating with your community well, not understanding what your community wants out of the game. But at the same time, there are two questions here I want to make sure we ask. Mm -hmm. uh, the first of which is when we have these issues, right? When someone claims, when they scream, this game is pay to win. Mm -hmm. you know, it, does that view represent a large portion of the community? Now, we can't really know this, I guess. Uh, it's hard to find evidence. Or is this just a minority screaming at the top of their heads? You know, I think Aaron said, where does the game go from here? Will Black Desert still be successful? Is this something that's going to negatively affect going forward? Or are there people who just don't give a shit at all and they're going to keep playing the game they don't care it doesn't really affect them because what's interesting and i'm not talking about black desert specifically is that oftentimes when we talk about pay to win or these small advantages like say mm -hmm. a piece of gear you buy in the cash shop for plus one stamina it's not going to affect the average player the 99 percent of the player but it's going to affect the top tier um best players in the game you know where those yeah. differences count for a lot but for me or you Open world PvP, it's not really going to matter too much. It's not, you know, that you could have a significant advantage. Um, so I, I guess the, the question I'm getting at is is this something that's going to kill Black Desert? Um, well, remember, Black uh, Desert is already a flop in Korea. So, yes. A flop in Korea, but I wouldn't but, call it a flop in the West, otherwise okay, it wouldn't so be reacting I think it's like already, this. it's already, I think, surpassed expectations based on its home market. Sure. 100%. So, so when, so where it goes from here, we got to make sure our perspective is set accordingly. Like, I think from here, almost everything, almost any positive uptick will be considered success, mm -hmm. considering how, sure, you know how, how how bad it flopped over there. And uh, lastly, the last question is: There's a typical consensus that in the East they don't, at least in China, they just accept pay to win. But over here, we rage. We yes. we hit the top of our MMORPG. We make videos that get hundreds of thousands of hits complaining and bitching about pay to win we care so much because in the west especially america uh there is this sense that everybody's supposed to be on equal ground we're all supposed to be able to pursue our dreams and all rise to the top of course that's a total fabrication it doesn't happen but and, and we then we translate that and we put it into our games and we think okay everyone needs to be in the same playing field i uh, think they heard that with the western mentality of like the reason i'm not the best is because this guy can pay money for it even though in reality <laughs> I will never be the best, you know, like some right. players are silver in league, they're like, they're never going to be good, right? But th th they're going to blame, if there's even one tiny element where they can pay for one tiny convenience, mm -hmm. you would blame somebody else, yeah, th th that mentality is definitely... But, but I do think we're the last generation that's going to really find an issue with it. I think mobile I gaming, agree. especially, mobile gaming here in the West is teaching yes. the next generation of gamers that, uh, <laughs> that pay, to, not fair. pay to win is A-OK, -okay, you know, so I think that's it'll fair. be less... Unfortunately, that's true. So pay to win is here to stay, boys. Oh, absolutely. It's not going anywhere. I'm not going to pay, though. Oh, maybe some in some cases. I know. Um, I'll, I'll bring some context because uh, being pay to, uh, pay to win is acceptable. People, you, you said being pay to win is more acceptable in Asia. I know Korean gamers, they don't like when games are pay to win. I think what it is is they're, they they can tolerate it a bit more. I mean, I don't think anyone really likes the fact that anyone can pay for advantage. No. This transcends cultures, but they're just more okay with it. They just accept it a bit more. And Western audience is a little more, much more vocal about it. And if we look at two games, the two other most profitable MMORPGs that are free to play are MapleStory and Dungeon Fighter Online. Firstly, Dungeon Fighter Online is the most 
pro most revenue generating MRPG in the world. Makes more money than WoW, for example, last year. And if you look at the game, there are very obvious pay for, pr pay for super super convenient or pay for pay to win elements. How you look at it. I'll run you down very quickly how that works. To get the best gear in the game, you need to run through uh, something called hell mode in the game. You can trigger hell mode for dungeons randomly, which happens once in a blue moon, or you can force a hell mode dungeon to happen via spending money in the cash shop. And in order to get epics in the game, you have to get in hell mode. So people end up spending thousands of dollars to get more hell mode runs than free-to-play users, and they can get better gear that way. So there are pay-to-win elements in DFO. Uh, Maple Story has some very obvious, you know, upgrade. You know, in order to upgrade your gear, you can, you know. Buy an item in the cash out that prevents your weapon from breaking if you fail to upgrade and so forth. But some of that stuff is also available by killing bosses, so it's not as pay to win. The issue with Black Desert Online and certain games is when a game is designed with open world PvP and this open interaction, pay to win becomes a bigger issue. In DFO, you never have to PvP if you never want to. Whereas in BDO, you can, you can just get jumped and killed. People and don't Guild like Wars, to feel cheated. Yeah. They, yeah. don't, they don't like to feel cheated when they're at a comp when they're competing against somebody, in like and, an actual yeah. like thing, you know. Like they they don't want to feel like, well, there's nothing I can do because that guy has more money than me. You know, that's that's a problem. Uh, Zenith, I was also talking about the Chinese DFO. I mean, again, uh, that's probably where that's where the game makes its most money too. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, yeah. The, the the version of DFO that we're playing in the West is basically a charity event. I don't think Next is making any money on it, so they're making all the money from. From China, so how it runs there is really the what sets the ground for how they're making money. And someone in chat said something about some Chinese players being fed up with the pay to win, so they're coming mm -hmm. to the global server. I'm sure some are doing that, but that's a negligible amount. Like, yeah, like you said, the revenue split between the Chinese and global services is you know like 99 percent one. Yes, so yeah, exactly. So I don't buy that the Chinese are fed up with pay to win. They they're perfectly okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> they're not okay with it. They're, they savor it. Mm. No, 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 they don't. They're fed up with it, but they're not going to use VPNs to access. Again, like, it doesn't. People, the average gamer isn't going to use a VPN to access a different version of a game. Because remember, no. it's IP blocked. And you have the great firewall in China and stuff, too. And you guys have VPN to do it. And most people are just going with the, the version they have. And people aren't tech savvy. A lot of people aren't tech savvy enough to even go for the international version, mm -hmm. even though they would prefer the international version. So what's the moral of the story here about... Well, number one, I did want to give a big F you to Kakao, Kakao Games just for breaking pay-to-win relevant again, because it's a conversation I yeah. keep having. Um, and I, I want to point out, uh, I feel like the community at large, and by the community at large, I mean Reddit, because it's the only one I really know of besides our own, uh, we, we harp way too much about the pay-to-win factor. It's important I to agree. be vigilant. But to make blanket statements that everything's pay to win, uh, it really sours the genre and um, someone needs to write agree. an essay and fucking figure out what exactly it refers to in a general sense. And I'm not even sure how to make, because we can't even define MMOs and, and make it uh, ubiquitous. But um, it, it, I think you can still enjoy a game. Like let's say we take the most pay to win game on the planet. You as a solo player, as the solo experience can still enjoy it. And we've been proven wrong about that with League of Angels too, myself particularly. Uh, I don't think just because something's pay to win, and I'm not defending anything that is, uh, what I mean is you can still enjoy yourself. The root of games is to have fun, so don't allow the pay to win factor to totally spoil the experience. It's kind of like just because in the real world I'm never going to be, you know, like um, some famous celebrity doesn't mean it sours my whole life. Yeah. I don't know if that's a fair exactly. analogy. That but is fair. You're not born um, tall. And it's a little tallest, ridiculous. The strongest, the biggest, the richest, right? Right. And I. It's as if the entire generation, or at least the minority that's vocal, is upset that, <laughs> I don't want to say it, but it's true, that things aren't fair. Uh, and it's, again, it's important to be vigilant, but don't let it ruin your entire attitude towards the industry. Because that fucking sucks. Then, then just get out, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, pay to win. Fuck you. <laughs> all right. In, uh, in more interesting news, as somewhat sure. related to buy to play, free to play, all that jazz. Okay, this is the first time I've seen a game actually go the other way. So it went from buy to play to free to play. Ah, yes. And then back to buy to play. I'm talking about Ark Survival of the Fittest. Yes. Uh, it was a spin off of the original game with just one mode, the Survival of the Fittest mode. You got Arena. Uh, and then recently, at the beginning of this month, they decided, you know what? Nah, no good. Uh, new people, <laughs> if you didn't add this to your Steam uh, library, you can no longer play, lo no longer play it for free. Uh, it's part of the main game again now. Which, 
Really? They have two good reasons for it. The first, and I think the biggest one, is they, they want to start adding mod tools. And what they didn't want What's people to do it? is they didn't want people to take the main element, the gameplay element, and just add them to the free-to-play version, and, mm. and therefore circumvent the whole price tag, right? Yeah. The second uh, point they made, which I think is a more interesting point, is they didn't know how to monetize the free-to-play version. And there's a great quote here by them. Uh, they said, uh, When a game like uh, Survival of the Fittest is made free-to-play, there are still expenses. This can range from development work, server costs, running of tournaments, prizes, and of course, the opportunity cost. To ensure that this game uh, remains a success and a uh, sound choice, Wildcard would have had to put a lot of resources and time into learning how to become a free-to-play developer. We don't know much about monetization, and quite frankly, we aren't interested in hiring an economics team to take over that process. It is much more in our and your best interest for Wildcard to solely focus on development of a game. We just aren't cut out for free-to-play mechanics. And I thought right, that was I very think... honest and very telling. Yeah, uh, I thought it was humbling, and um, I think they they made the right decision because if they tried to force a cash app without because all right so like a free to play and, and this shows how hard it is to make a free to play cash app right we had this discussion earlier uh yeah. it's not easy to monetize free to play games. exactly it's not trivial maybe, to add the money pits and maybe they were being they were exaggerating when they said a team of economists but it does show that it's something out of their reach because if you screw up your cash app as we've been talking about uh you really tarnish your game's name uh for the long term yeah so i think they they made the right choice um it does feel kind of shitty but again uh they were honest about it and they were honest with the community about right. it so here's what i gotta chime in here's what i gotta chime in listen <laughs> they said for example oh, look I, I, there's nothing wrong with making the game by the players to complete their decision but sure. they should have known i mean they, they did know i don't know what, what they're saying now before they even made survival the finish right as a, as a free game they knew there was gonna be some development work required right and they still chose to release as a free-to-play game Okay, so, so they knew that go they knew going into it that uh, okay, we're doing this. And they had no they had no business model for monetizing the game, right? None, zero. And they I they I didn't think about it, or they just, just made, made it free to play, you know, as a as a way to promote ARC. That's where they're gonna make their money. People buy the, the retail versus ARC. And knowing that, it just seems kind of silly for them to to now say, Oh, we don't know how to monetize free to play. You you released it with no expectation of a cash shop. And now I, I, Again, again, it's perfectly fine for them to make it that way. It just seems kind of silly that they launched it with no expectation of monetization, and now they couldn't monetize it, so they're folding it to ARC. And it's still free for everyone that bought it. Yeah, so, so if you added literally it, Everyone good. that wanted to play the game already has the game. So right. what, are they, what are they doing by this move? Well, that came back to the, the development kit, was mm -hmm. making the tools more easily accessible. And I don't really know the intricacies of this, so I can't give an mm -hmm. explanation that's sound. But um, they essentially said that there were issues with uh, allowing somebody who wants to mod the free-to-play version of the game, Survival of the Fittest, using the assets in the buy-to-play version of the game. So say I'm a modder, I'm playing this yeah. free game, I would be using content that I'm supposed to have purchased, but I haven't, so that's why oh, they wanted see, to, okay. to merge the two. That was their primary reason. Mm -hmm. And the secondary reason had to do with monetization. I, I, I want to point out that monetization in a survival game is much different yes. than monetization in MMORPG. Uh, I... I I can't imagine, I mean, cosmetics are great and all, but in a survival game that's first person, you can't even see yourself, so it's not like they're looking at your own mm -hmm. um, costume or whatever bullshit, and it's kind of thematically out of place on like a fantasy or sci-fi world. And also, it had RPG leveling, so what would you do? Increase the amount of experience someone gets and that could in the really game, and that vibe, would be yeah. seen as pay to win, so I'm not even sure. Well, I think that was, they're like, how do we do this without looking like assholes? And they said, oh, we can't do it, so... And we have this development kit we want to use, so we might as well bring it back. Um, and I think something you said that was important is when they first made Survival of the Fittest, I do think it was there for advertising, kind of yeah. like what esports is for right now. If you don't know, esports really doesn't make that much money. It's more of a marketing tool for a lot of these uh, companies, all these studios, to put their game out there and draw in more fans and, I guess, basically, eventually merchandise. Um, and, and I guess it wasn't drawing conversions to the Evolve project, which you can see in H1Z1. Uh, in H1Z1, the King of the Hill version of the game was far more popular than the survival mm -hmm. game, which is a bit different, but um, those King of the Hill mods, like the culling and whatnot, are extremely popular compared to the survival version of the game. Though they, they have fallen off. You know, the culling, for example, I, I know Shu and I played quite a bit when it came out, and we played 
I play with three friends too. You get about 500 or so concurrent users now. It was much more when it first launched. Sure. Yeah. It's the new thing. Yeah. But I'm curious how many people are still playing uh, Survival of the Fittest. I'm going to find out right now for us. It's still getting, uh, it's got 674 players uh, as of an hour ago. It's not bad. Not bad. Yeah. Um, it's still an early access game. Who knows if on launch they see a boost. I mean, games have done it in the past. Terraria, Starbound, but those are a little different, but still. I mean, big shout out to Ark Survival Evolved. That game has been consistently topping on the Steam charts basically since <laughs> it launched. It's at a whopping 37,000 players online as of an hour ago. It peaked 50 grand in the last 24 hours. And funny, all time peak is only 85 grand, right? So going from an all time peak of 85 grand to a 24 hour peak of 50 grand is still really impressive. So Dave. They've been doing an awesome job. If you had that chart open, uh, I have a question about it. It's a very similar game to Ark. Uh, the H1Z1 also did the spin off with the free to play versus buy to play. Oh, no. They, they made two buy to play. Right? Yes. Yeah, they did. They did two buy to play. They turned one. <laughs> when that game was originally supposed to be free to play. <laughs> Fucking. Well, there's, there's a transition I don't like. Oh, my uh, King of the Hill currently has 10,500 wow. players. It's King of the Kill, not King of the Hill, remember? Oh, I'm sorry. King of the yeah, Kill. A little creative. And whereas their Just Survive mod it has 2506. Um, and I, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a disparity. It really just shows people want to play the King of the, the, King of the Kill mode. I think that one was easier to design for Daybreak. I think they gave up on copying DayZ for Just Survive. But maybe, I, you know what? Is the, we've had two, in the last couple months, we've had two games switch up their models entirely. And I wonder if this is... This is part of growing pains for figuring out how to monetize your games, or if this is going to be something we see other companies do. I mean, your prediction for Black Desert still holds it. You oh, still 100%. have your one year I, mark. I think it's going to go free to play. To, this is this is a sign too. And I will lose my bet. <laughs> yeah, this is a sign that they're embracing the free to play model. People are going to start asking, why are you charging that thirty bucks to play the game, or it was forty bucks, when you have all these features in the game which are just exactly the same as the Asian version? You know, the like, like I know we we talk a lot about like people not knowing how to monetize their games but like that's like an actual thing in like the in, in the industry it's not something that comes intuitively to a lot of people because you have to understand that that generally like people that you hire to you know do your business analysis and stuff like that they don't really play games as much as like we do yeah you know so we feel like we know a lot about what we would want but you know people that are on the business aspect of like co companies like generally like this is a very specialized skill to like know how to do, you know, a cash shop or something like that, right? Like, like I'll give you an example. Like when I used to, uh, you know, before Riot, um, before League of Legends launched, right? When mm -hmm. the game was still coming out, they didn't know anything about monetizing a free-to-play game. I mean, they they knew like they wanted the game to be free-to-play and that was the future. But, I mean, I mean, let me let, let me give you a good example. They used to really they used to release two. Champions at the same time. Do you remember that? It was a while ago. I don't remember when they released two. Yeah, I started they, playing season they one, but two not... champions at the same time. And like you and me, Omer, mm -hmm. would know that that's a terrible idea, right? That that's yeah. absolutely terrible. Like for monetization, like to have. And another thing that 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 happened back then was, uh, characters like champions that like released that week, they were free the first week they came out. And you and me, Omer, we would know yeah. that that's a terrible <laughs> idea. Yes. Right. And like I had to tell them that when I was working there, like the biz I had to talk to the business people and tell them like, you know, that's a terrible idea. Here's mm -hmm. why. I play a lot of free to play games. I've sunk a lot of money into these games, as you all know. Mm -hmm. This is how this is why this is bad. And they don't know. It's it's it, I mean, so them saying that like we don't know how to monetize a free to play game, this is a valid thing to say. Like it's not a that's true. common yeah. it's not a common skill set. Like we talk about it like it's matter of fact because that's our world. But People generally who a big wig would be like, okay, that guy knows a lot about business. He doesn't necessarily know about our type of business. The, the intricacies of balancing the a cash shop. intricacies of balancing cash shop. Exactly. It's, it's a very... He, he may make the call to make a game. Like, for example, the move they're making Black Desert Line, I have no doubt is going to spike profits, right? All of a sudden, they're going to make more money. That's, that's, that's a given, right? And but, that's what they're thinking about. That's yeah, what the business guy is thinking about. Exactly. Yeah. He's going to get his fat bonus because he made the company double their money, right? But then they're going to realize, yeah. wait a minute. The, the game is falling off now and then they're going to make less money in the long term. Like They'll make less money in a span of five years, maybe a lot less money in five years because of this move. But they, in the short term, they're going to make a shit ton of money. And exactly. that's a balancing so, act. Yeah. So that's exactly why I can see why cash shops are not living up to the expectations that we as gamers have is because 
we're, I mean, the fact that we play games all day is like a kind of a testament that we're not like a business like type mm -hmm. of person, you know? So like, I mean, that's just like a, a developer insight. I mean, that's like what I experienced yeah. when I worked on League of Legends and um, uh, the summary of it is hire us, guys. <laughs> <laughs> the MMOs.com <laughs> consultancy is going to happen one day, right? <laughs> but, I, uh, I honestly think that we could actually give a really good service to people. Really I, I, I think so It'd too. be worth it. It would be 100% yeah. worth it. We take equity in the game. Uh, give us 1% of your game. We give you wow. all the advice. 2%. Two percent. That 1% one, one is a lot. <laughs> I want two. <laughs> Gummy go wants two. <laughs> I want two and I, I, don't, I don't haggle. I only haggle up. I mean, I, three, I told three, we'll take three. <laughs> I tell this story a lot, like Canary, like Canaris in the chat. But like, um, when I was uh, working at Riot, I told them I was like, "Hey, man, like, if you guys wanted esports to be really big, you need to like treat it like a real sport. You need to have like teams. You need to have like weekly, like you know, like Monday Night yes. Football, but league, mm -hmm. but it, but a league version." And they're like, "Nah, that would never happen." And, and like, here comes LCS. Right now. Yes. <laughs> Rules. Called it. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying is like is like not necessarily like like one one or two people in the company like don't have the insight that like a gamer does. You know, you need to like be it. It's not it's not a common skill set. All right, I, I, I want I want to take this away to a slightly relevant topic because we're talking about free to play and games going by to play. We have MRPG, a pretty big MRPG, two MRPGs, uh, Age of Wushu two and Dark and Light being unveiled in China. I think a week and a half ago at China Joy. Yep. Interestingly enough, I can go show the trailer on, on there. Sure. Interestingly Just enough, right now. the game is coming out in early 2017 or so. And given that it's Snail Games, you'd expect it to be free-to-play because they made Age of Wushu, which is free-to-play. In fact, almost I think all their games in China are free-to-play. But in this case, for Age of Wushu 2 and Dark and Light, they actually said that it, it's going to be on Steam, and they didn't specify it will be free-to-play or buy-to-play. So that people are saying it could, it might go, but it might be buy-to-play. I would actually, I would like that. It, to me, it kind of signals a maturity for the Chinese market. No, it's, you don't not think about, so? it's not about being mature. It's about, we've seen what happens in a lot of, in, in, in BTO. No, and I see what you're saying. We've seen what can happen. You know? No, no, I, I get it. But what I mean by that is um, there's a level of polish that you're starting to see, at least in the trailers and from what can be expected, whether it's yeah. Moonlight Blade or Dark and Light. I mean, this teaser really doesn't show anything. But yeah. I think that some of these Chinese companies... Um, they feel that they have a level of polish that warrants a buy-to-play strategy that might be viable. And I think that's great for... I mean, there are people are really excited about Revelation Online. Now, that's not a buy-to-play game, but yeah. I haven't really seen excitement for a Chinese game before. And, you know, they're, I think this is kind of proving, and even if it doesn't work for them, it proves that they feel that they can uh, compete on the stage with South Korea and Western Studios. I mean... The game is going to be launched for consoles. They, they said they intend to release both games for consoles. So that's another reason why people are saying it's going to cost money. Mm. Because console, typically, when they release on console, it does cost money. But th then again, we do have games like Neverwinter, Smite, and a few other, just a whole bunch of games that ported on console. that are still free to play. But Age of Wushu 2, I feel like the problem is, too, as a Chinese studio, it's almost like, as a Westerner, we kind of have the perspective that, they, oh, it's Chinese, they can't charge money, right? <laughs> Let's be real. Like... If Perfect World says they're going to charge money for their next uh, MMORPG, what are you guys going to say? No. Like, come on. I think that perception's are? about to change, though. I think, <laughs> yeah. like, like we were talking about with uh, the next generation of gamers will just accept uh, pay-to-win strategies and paying to get ahead. I think that uh, China is going to be an accepted uh, competitor in the market. I think they're going to be just as relevant as other uh, countries that put out games. So that's well, my prediction. We We... we Grew up in a funny time with League of Angels 2 and Perfect World and Swordsman Online. So, <laughs> and people aren't going to remember those forever. They're already in obscurity. I mean, China already owns Riot Games. So they already have literally. Oh, the well, biggest Tencent. Game. Tencent. Tencent owns everything. China so owns yeah. it. It's not China, it's Tencent. All right, so Tencent already owns uh, the people that make Clash of Clans, that make Clash Royale. They own 10% of Activision Blizzard. <laughs> they own Riot Games. So, Chinese. They own everything. Financial muscle and power, just not through their own brands. You know, no. Chinese brands in gaming just aren't big in America. The, and they release a lot of games. It just they don't take off in America. The issue is that um, I don't believe that Asian design is that good. I think I think. Whoa, you know, whoa! Hey, I'm just being honest. Like, I think we have the Trump in the West as far as like design. You got him Trump. Can't stop the Trump. Trump. Can't stop the Trump. But but design wise, like like like. You know, companies in the West just make more fun games 
like in, in my opinion like they they know how to balance like you know the bullshit with the good stuff you know mm-hmm. whereas whereas a lot of asian games are just like full on they just feel like they don't feel good to play a lot of the time wow you know i've noticed play about it. asian yeah. games the cartoony ones have a lot more character in it fun than like the ones that try to be realistic graphics like unreal engine yeah. asian games just don't feel right somehow yeah i agree i agree with that uh, on the positive side Asian companies, they get shit done, all right? I'm looking at, like, the <laughs> Chinese release schedules. I was, looking, I was doing some research on, like, two Chinese gaming companies, Perfect World and Chang Yu. I'm looking, like, these companies release, like, multiple big games every year. I mean, like, literally full 3D gorgeous-looking games every year. Like, and there's so many of these gaming companies in China. They just release so many more PC products than Western games. Like, what, what are some big Western releases? It's really, like, every year. There's Brown maybe like those? a handful of yeah. Western releases. You get you get a few indie games that are throwing their you know trying out to make an MMO, and there's a whole bunch of indie games still like working on a game, but there really aren't that many big releases in the West from Western game companies for MMORPGs. Whereas it's still a big thing in China. I mean, I guess they go with the scatterfire approach. Maybe some of them will stick, but the games look graphically good and they seem like they have production value, but they don't take off in the West. Oh. Well. I mean, so they get shit done, why, but yeah. Why why make MMOs when you can just make games with a phone? Everyone's got a phone in in the last. So yeah. One last thing I wanted to say about this is this. I want to bring this news up too about Age of Wushu Two and Dark and Light because I know last week or the week before Altai said everything's going mobile and it's just the way it is, right? Are but despite mobile it? being bigger and bigger, you still have studios like Snail Games putting big money, uh, maybe relative speaking, into games like Age of Wushu Two and Dark and Light. I mean, they're, they're spending millions of dollars making PC games still. So, but PC Omer, gaming is not dead. Is that a mistake? Yeah, pro- probably. Is like, that a mistake? <laughs> what is Snail, re- what is snail Games' about- record here, okay, of like yeah. PC games? <laughs> I remember, you know, I used to play some old Snail Game games. Uh, I think Age of Armor was one of them. Yeah, awful. I mean, come on. Like, Five Street. Come on. Five Street is where it's at, all right? All right, all right. Five, Five Street, Street is really their hidden, their trump card, right? They're going to bring it back. They're going to really going to new advertising blitz, all right? Five Street will be the next esport. You wait and see. Fun fact, Quality guys, game. Uh, my brother and I were just randomly walking around L.A. And across the street from where we, we happened to be, like, we only explored, like, 0.1% of L.A. was the Snail Games U.S. headquarters. Remember that? <laughs> yeah, I remember that. I was like, whoa, what are the odds? <laughs> but, yeah, unfortunately, everything's going mobile. But we still see some, some PC games happening. And on the fact that everything's going mobile, what? Yeah, Toby, did, I think we had a few big game announcements this uh, week that are going mobile. I actually didn't plan for this one, but I'll bring it up. It, it seems like... Every South Korean developer wants to put their games on mobile. There is, and I'll get a video for it. Uh, Blade and Soul has a mobile game coming out called Han Moon Rising. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mabinogi Heroes, also known as Vindictus, also has a mobile port. That's uh, a new I, one. That was just this that one was just introduced announced. at China Joy uh, 2016. Mm-hmm. And there's two Lineage mobile games uh, coming out. Uh, very odd to have two coming out at the same time. Uh, let's see if I can get the name here. One is called Blood. I want to say Blood Moon Rising or something. Hong Moon um, Rising. No, no, that's Blade and Soul Hong Moon Rising. I'm confusing them. But it's funny. It seems like I think everyone's testing the waters. Can they take these old IPs and put them on mobile and make them work? And I think if they're successful, you can say goodbye to these companies trying to push out more games on PC. And they do look good. Uh, Very polished. but, so I mean, I haven't played them. I haven't watched this before. This Hanwoon Rising one. Is this supposed to be a full-fledged MMORPG? Or is there something this, else? Okay, so there's very... So when they announce these things, they don't really give out much information. But I mean, from what I can tell, it's going to be a stage-based a stage based ARPG. So okay. maybe I, I spoke wrong. Um, it's not these... And the same with um, Vindictus. It, it looks more like a stage-based ARPG uh, with the top-down like, view. Like Heroes of Incredible Tales. Like Heroes of Incredible, Incredible Tales, which is you know, the analogy. Mm-hmm. So I think okay. First of all, all right. I played Blade and Soul a little bit. Or you mm-hmm. played it longer. Should have played yeah. it longer. Somehow, the franchise doesn't have the same oomph, you know, as like the world building characters, interesting characters, as like even like Maple Story or Ro, or obviously like WoW and stuff. So I, I, I think I, you're right. Do they gain anything by using the Blade and Soul franchise? Is what I meant my, to say. My counter to that is why the hell does Master X Master uh, exist and build off their franchises? Well, well exactly. Does that, but, I mean, does it have any cachet? To, maybe, maybe they just have big egos and think they're more popular than they actually are. Also, but they're going to try. Build a franchise, and this is the way you do it. You know, That's you true. Make, you maybe this. Maybe you're right. Maybe maybe uh, Blade and Soul just didn't have the pull that Aro, World of Warcraft, 
or Final Fantasy app. It obviously doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. But maybe this new mobile game they make becomes such a big sensation that all of a sudden the Blade and Soul franchise becomes meaningful now. Okay. You know? Fair, fair enough. Fair I enough. think that's what they're trying to do. Also, uh, Transformers is also going mobile. Yeah. It'll be a counterpart to. Uh... Have you guys seen Transformers? That game looks like a oh, complete. You mean Overwatch, you mean over Transformers? <laughs> it's a complete Overwatch. Transformers mode. Watch? Yeah, Transformers <laughs> Watch. <laughs> I have not seen this. Let me. Somebody, somebody link right, this up. It's uh, so funny. I think because I don't think any of us are. I mean, I saw Transformers as a kid, but none of us are avid fans of Michael Bay's films. But uh, apparently, Transformers is enormous, still an enormous IP, and very popular in China. At China Joy, two Transformers games were revealed. It's really two parts of the same game. One is Transformers Online for PC, and then there's a counterpart being made for mobile. Uh, both announced at China Joy. And it, it and it's funny. What really gives away the Overwatch vibe is how you start the game because it's character based. Oh my god! Yeah, oh, that, you start the game. You have a little shield. You run out. I mean, the, the game it's play will be eight though, be not six v six, guys. Totally different. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> even even your abilities because you have like E, you have shift. You've like, everyone's got a few abilities too with their heroes, and you start off in that little like like little drop ship the same way you do in uh, yeah yeah in Overwatch. All right, totally totally a little off topic here, but just seeing the eight slots here remind me of this. I know we talk a lot about MMORPGs kind of regressing as a genre in terms of ambition. But it's also true of shooters. I remember years ago, maybe someone can look up exactly when Battlefield, the original, came out, 1942. But mm -hmm. I remember back then on my dookie computer, CRT monitor, playing 32 versus 32 FPS yeah, on a single yeah. server with battleships, with airplanes, with, you know... Humvees. That was, was 2002. 2002. 2002. You, you were, were. I was 14 years ago. I was very ago. young. <laughs> but but how is it that like games today have like? Holy shit! You were 13 when that came out. Yeah. But think about okay. it. Right? I was 12. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah, it is insane. Like, today, when like there's 20 guys on a server, it starts lagging, like stuttering. Like, well, how was it that Battlefield could pull that off back then? And the funny thing, people always say that with MMORPGs, there's this huge issue of having a lot of players on the same screen. And it's like this, this thing they always have to overcome, right? But again, 2002, <laughs> we had 64 players, the ships, airplanes, and in one battlefield, and it just worked. Yep, it just worked. It's graphics, man. It's like people like yeah, but that's relative, isn't graphics it? Hard, you yeah, know? I mean, the graphics weren't bad back then for battlefield. That was yeah. top of the line, I think, almost. The people are saying there's like this netcode issue when you have all these players in the same area. Like, mm -hmm. man, I don't understand technicalities of it to, to even begin to rebuttal it. But come on, even we we've got like 14 guy. years for this. Come on. We need a technical Tim to tell us why yeah, we're wrong. I, I'm sure I, I, we're wrong I for some wonder reason. What the what the problem is there? I mean, wow! Like in comparison to Battlefield, it does seem like everything has regressed. Yeah, like it's 2016. The, our top shooter is a 6v6 <laughs> versus you well, know. Keep, keep in mind, Trinium Wars was supposed to have a thousand player battles. Unfortunately, they didn't have a thousand player player base. So <laughs> they had like 15 that players. Like... They had like 15... <laughs> that game had the audacity to charge money. Come on. I knew that was going free to play we, the we second it was announced. Free. Yeah. yeah, we gave out. It was like one of those games where if you paid, you got ripped off. You know why? But every yeah, website had like thousands of keys to give away to give you yeah. free access to the game. But if you go on Steam, you just go on the page. It costs money. So if you ended up paying for Trinium Wars, you got ripped off. And it shut down like within a couple of months. Complete disaster. But as expected. Oh my god, though the, and even in RPG, we talked about ambition a lot, where games like. Ultima had like how persistent world housing. They had so many features, and now we have so many games that have become like almost like hallways. Games like Hero Wars, Vindictus, which don't have open worlds even. You know that games have gotten a lot more basic and less ambitious, unfortunately. But they've also gotten like more streamlined and smoother. So obviously pros and cons. Yeah. Yeah, you um, know what it might be too is um this is just a, a theory, but I feel like a lot of people made games back in the day not necessarily with money being the primary like issue like a lot of people are like i feel before it was like let's make a cool game and mm -hmm. then let's make money off of it but now i feel like it's let's make money off of it and let's make a game you no, know I think you're like, right that's, that's true that, that, that's the, the industry is theory. much more developed in terms of like streamlined you know here's abc check the boxes get the product shipped next one yeah no because people that could make the games right people that could program and make games they were the nerds that enjoyed the games right mm -hmm. when the the pc gaming industry took off the only people that were capable of making games were the nerds and they weren't the business people it was only when the business when the industry became so big that the business uh, people got in and they yeah. started monetizing it and became, made, made an industry out of it really before it was yeah. just passionate people making games that they <laughs> like and that's that's how you know so what you're saying is happens. the gaming industry is now a soulless machine 
pushing out garbage for players to digest so someone can fill their not, pockets with money. Not Metal every, <laughs> not every <laughs> game. No, no, company, I was being an but, asshole. Yeah, you were just being but an I asshole. But I mean, it, I, I mean, I was just talking to, um, was it Rev mm -hmm. in chat about it? Uh, Rev from LVD, we were just talking about it in chat about how, like, we need to take a gaming industry back and make gaming great again. Make, make MMORPGs great again. I, I actually yeah. I have an article about that. <laughs> you do. You do. You, do. You, should, you, should, you should plug that. I people, do. I'll people plug People don't it. realize it was a parody, which is pretty funny. People don't realize it was a parody. And you know what? I don't want them to realize it. If you don't it's realize it was a parody right away, you don't deserve to recognize it. <laughs> I did yeah. want to sh uh, shift gears to a topic that I think Shu, you might be able to comment on uh, quite right. a bit. Uh, if you may not know, but in Overwatch, uh, there's mm -hmm. a mini game currently out called Lucio Ball, which is out to celebrate the Olympics. It replaced I the weekly Lucio brawl. Ball. Me too. And uh, there was a, a very big bug where, as you jumped into the game or after someone scored a goal, if you keep spamming H, you, you can, can switch, switch to characters. a hero who's not Lucio. Yeah. Uh, now, to me, that's hilarious. And I thought the videos were really funny. But Jeff Kaplan. Uh, who's the creative director for Overwatch, made a statement on the forums that basically says, please do not exploit this bug, fair warning. That's really a warning wow. of a threat, right? That yeah. sounds like a threat. Uh, it doesn't yeah. absolutely doesn't say you'll be banned, but it does kind of imply that some type of punishment will come mm -hmm. about. And my thinking is, uh, when I see an exploit in a game, uh, it's not my responsibility to refrain from exploiting that exploit. It's up to the developers to find out a workaround, and th there's no deserved punishment for the player who kind of takes advantage of that bug? Okay. Um, and this... I get, I get why it's there, why, why Kaplan's putting out that um, warning, but it does feel like um, I'm being treated like a child, and it's almost insult. But shoot, uh, please tear me well, apart. Well, well, here's the thing: are, 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 are you, are you a child though? <laughs> yes. The issue is, I am a child. I'm a millennial. I'm a it child. It happens if it happens to you accidentally. You happen to get in. So, I mean, I believe they shouldn't, if they were to ban people, I don't think they should be a blanket ban because what if it just happens on accident? I mean, you know, it might, right? It's and, a mini game. And, and then it well, happens to you, and then, well, here's the, here's the issue, though, is there are a lot of people that want to actually play Lucio Ball, and you are being an asshole, and you're making it so they can't play Lucio Ball. But and, they can fix like, it, it themselves. Can they just disable the HK? Yeah, and, they, 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 sh they should. They, they, they should fix it. what the fuck? Then why are they fighting the best? <laughs> Okay, they should fix it, but you shouldn't be like going out of your way to fuck with people. You know, like that's half the fun. That's why I play games. <laughs> okay, I think we went, we went over toxicity last week. Shot, right? shot. You, play games you, should, you should, you should. Like, <laughs> if, if it happens to you once on the accident, sure, okay, sure. That's... But if you're a if you're a repeat offender, if you're literally every game you're fucking up, like you know the key. Whoa, 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 like, whoa, whoa. shoot, shoot. Well, it's a viable strat in Lucio Ball. We get one it's Widowmaker, two threat. Lucios. I, I pick off their Lucios, and then we score easier. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh my god. Here's my thing. Here's my, all right, I'll, I'll you guys you should guys. be banned. I'll meet you guys in the middle here, okay? With Lucio <laughs> Ball, it doesn't matter, right? It's a, it's like a gimmicky uh, mini game yeah, yeah, for the Olympics, case. right? But I don't buy your thing that uh, glitches aren't your responsibility and you shouldn't be punished. Imagine an MMORPG with a dupe pack, right? You can yeah. dupe your gold. You can double your gold over and over again. Yeah, Diablo 1, go ahead. Okay. Or that's a the key feature in the game. Okay, at some point... You know, you're kind of fucking up the whole economy for like thousands of people, right? Intentionally. Sure. So I do see a room for air there. Air, my counter is that these things happen in real life too. There's bugs in real life. What? And I, I exploit them. You can go to jail for the that. System. That's not true. You yeah. need to encourage people to report these instead of like, hey, I'm gonna. You, you need to add that threat of like, if I exploit this and I try to keep it a secret, I might get caught one day and might get fucked. Like that. I mean. I do think important. I'm definitely wrong. I'm definitely wrong, but I don't like the notion that um, players should ever be severely punished for a mistake on the developers, right? It, it is a mistake it's that, that you're... Reported. It's Go a ahead, mistake Shum, sorry. That, it, it is a mistake, like, sure, it's a mistake, but you're, you're exploiting it for your own personal gain to purposely get an unfair advantage over other people, and... I mean, it, it, it's just the same as, like, using a hack, really. It's like there, there's an exploit in their system. Well, let, me use this, let me use this hack to, like, you know, but, you it? know, maybe you, maybe you shouldn't have an exploit in your game. I mean, that's true. You I'm shouldn't gonna, have an exploit in your I'll, game. I'll, I'll, I'll just got to figure it out. Listen, for Lucia Ball, nothing. No, if, you, if anybody gets banned over this in Lucia Ball, I think it's they have a right to be upset. Okay, you should but be banned if, over Lucia Ball. If, if you're doing exploits <laughs> in MMORPG or you're hacking, 
Uh, that's different, and then you really impact the game. It doesn't the... matter. You're talking magnitude now. You're you're saying yeah. You're saying well, I can fuck it up for three people. Fuck them. But well, if you if, if you dare make it over that's ten, that's barely an exploit. Oh, no. That's not, that's it's... barely an, that's not even an exploit. They're hitting the H key. The H key is supposed to change your hero. It's part of the oh game, as far God, as I'm concerned. Dude. Yeah, Oliver has a great point here. It is part of the game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if I if I download a third party program to alter the the way the game works, I'm literally cheating. I'm breaking the game. If I'm hitting the H key to change my hero, which is the key in the game. It's a stupid level bug. It's like, that's not even an exploit. That's just like, there was a, retardation there was just a on Blizzard's part. There was just a patch on Overwatch. Like, literally, oh, then hopefully like, that while, fixed it. Yeah, it like, probably while, fixed it. While we were having, here, let me check the patch. Notes. Just like, to point out, as uh, Witchy uh... mentioned, uh, the bans were issued, and they were apparently seven day bans for abusers. Hmm. Uh, I think seven days is a little harsh, but uh, at least it's not a perma ban, because that if they perma ban, that would have been ridiculous. Just um, ban them from Lucio Ball. Yeah, why not just have them on Lucio Ball? Ball. Correct. Yeah, that, that correct. Right. Right. Here's, here's, a, here's another good analogy, ball. guys. It's like the Normal difference between Lucio glitching in like Warcraft Three, the official ladder, versus glitching in like tower defense in Warcraft Three. Yeah, sure. exactly. Okay, Who like, cares about cheating yeah. with tower defense? Well, no, you should. You still should be able to cheat with third-party programs on either. Yeah. But like glitching, glitching. An, an in-game glitch is more acceptable in like a casual, non-serious custom game, right? Than, That's fair. That's than, like, fair. The main main game. That's fair. Have you guys uh, played Lucio Ball? I know Shu has. I have not. I've uh, just I, actually, I, I suggest you try it. I think it's a lot of fun. It's like and, uh, uh, it's like the game, right? Rocket League. Almost like Rocket League. Yeah, but I mean, but, I play Overwatch to play and stop noobs and competitive. Right? I don't play Overwatch for Lucio Ball. If I want to play Lucio Ball, I'll play Rocket League. Right? I think well, the the most interesting thing about Lucio Ball is uh, it's Blizzard showcasing what is possible with Overwatch. Mm -hmm. So we can expect to maybe see a lot more cool. Um, brawls rather than just like you can only pick one character. You know, yeah, like, that's a good point. Shu. It's <laughs> it's it adds a lot of like possibility of like man, like they can make a soccer game out. They can they can make a uh, was it Rocket League out of this? Like what mm -hmm. else is possible in the future for our brawls that they're not just gonna be like? Because I mean, I have to admit the brawls before this were pretty bad. They were lame <laughs> like, for sure. Terrible. Yeah. So, so it's like it, it it's a lot more unique. And sorry, I said more unique. It's uh, it's unique, and we can expect to see um, more of it in the future. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take. Since we're discussing Blizzard, uh, let's take it back to the and more RPG. Uh, World World right. of Legion Shift is still set to please. launch uh, later this month, I think on the 30th. And actually, they actually explained the way leveling's gonna work, and it's actually pretty cool. And I'm surprised it took Blizzard this long to implement leveling like this. Like you show off that video in the background, but essentially, Peace. in the Broken Isles, the latest you know, the area in Legion, you could actually complete. It, it's going to dynamically adjust rewards and difficulty to your level automatically. So you can actually choose the path in which you take to finish all four of these zones. So you know, it's not just like, you know, you go to this zone, then that zone, then that zone, which has historically been every expansion for, for WoW and pretty much every MRPG. So you, you can just do whatever order you want. Real, real quick, yeah. real, real quick they, they, uh, this just came out today that the Demon Hunters are now live. Yep. If you purchase World of Warcraft Legion, you can play as a Demon Hunter now. Correct. That's good. Yeah. That's like, weird. Why, uh, why do other games do this? Why not, uh, a, a lot of games do do this now. Dynamic, dynamic leveling? leveling? Yeah, Guild Wars 2. But the I way actually... the, It's a little different. It's a little different. Because again, in Guild Wars 2, it scales you down. I don't think, you, you don't get scaled up or anything, but you still have to like... Here, you have four zones. You can complete them in any order you want. Yeah. You, you can't complete higher level zones in Guild Wars 2. You, you just you can go to lower level zones and you do it fine. That's true. That's true. So it's a little different, but yeah. Guild Wars 2 is a good example of a game that handles dynamic leveling very well. But why haven't we seen this in other games? Well, this is a good, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to do, but it just seems like more fun. I actually don't know if I like this. Um, really? I think that this works for confined areas, but you can never make the entire world dynamic. And the reason why I say that is there's, and we've talked about this, there's something special about holding content beyond the player's reach. Yes. So yeah. what I what I liked about the traditional leveling in WoW is, um, even though it's not, you know, maybe it's too old school, is you kind of had something, you looked, you looked forward to something, you kind of had a, a, a yeah. trajectory on where to go, and you had some choices and leeway, but when you have this dynamic leveling um, in, say, a whole new, say it was the whole continent, like okay. a zone that's very big, um, number one, it, it's limited direction, which is fine, you kind of wander with your head cut off and just kind of mm -hmm. land where you land. But there, I like the I like the feeling of pushing through an area, kind of like the hero's journey. And as I reach the upper tiers of levels, the zones become more chaotic. 
there's like a narrative within the zone. Maybe I'm not explaining myself. Right. No, no, so, I, I understand. That's fine. So like the zones will become more corrupt, or like I see like the war in the narrative unfold. Um, when it's dynamic like this, it kind of devalues each zone. It kind of says, okay, each of these zones is completely equal. Go wherever you want. Whereas in a traditional leveling path, the upper tier zones kind of have this. Um, they kind of have this. Uh, aura or stage presence of being, you know, this is the final zone. This is where the the chapter for this expansion is going to end. This is where you're going to level. This is the mo these are the most important quests. Right, now your final quest movie. kind of is like meaningless. It's also devaluing your progress because, like, like if everything is always going to be like a strength in comparison to yours, you, it's you like guys you are don't... taking what I said to like the maximum level. All right, you, you can all do right. this in confined areas. Now, I'm not saying the whole game should be this way. No, no, no. Even for this this zone, this uh, new continent or whatever it is, okay. uh, this new area. Is. Okay, this one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I think okay. it, it works for very small spaces. There's a limit. Yes. Yeah, and, I agree. And the, the benefit is that you can you can you know you can uh, exp give you the freedom to explore this mysterious new domain as you see fit. It's just that so often we do see ourselves okay. First, you go to after yeah. Goldshire, you go to Westfall, then you go to Darkshire, then you go to Stranglethorn Vale. Like this path is so carved out in a lot of and at least in WoW. The benefit of WoW, there's a, at least there was a couple zones you could go to. Like you didn't have to level an SDV if you don't want to, right? Yeah, you're right. But like in a lot of games, well, you have to level this zone but, and then this zone to and then defend that zone. to defend that, right? And again, I agree that it does work in certain situations, especially yes. here where let's say all four zones are, uh, they feel as powerful, just different. Yeah. But in the original game, for example, I don't want the Green Meadow Happy Land to be equally difficult as the, the Mountain of Despair, you know, the dragon. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, like, okay, it doesn't make right. sense for the boars to be as hard to kill as dragons, right? But yes. in, in four equal zones in terms of the monster falling... We are taking it to an extreme. Yeah. 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 But that's okay. It's good. Yeah. As long as it's like a lost temple, a, dr a mountain, uh, you know, as long as they're equally powerful looking, it's fine. Mel yeah. Grunty in our chat actually says, I think choose your own path takes away from the building up of a story. That's why choose your own adventure uh, is a niche and not a bestseller for a reason. Mm. That's true. You can't take it to the extreme, but it can be done, you know, in in, in ways to make it fun. I think this is a good, this, it is a good move by Blizzard to at least change up a bit. Mm -hmm. And I do want to, like, again, I just don't want to take that whole rail cart, rail path from mm -hmm. this zone to that zone to that zone. I think we've all done the whole, like, okay, from this zone to that zone way too many times. Some games make it more obvious than others. I know, like, just a lot of older Korean MRPGs, like Asta Story. I know Aaron played that for some reason. You finish all the quests in one zone, then you go to the next zone, and, like, there's no way to change paths. You just, everyone's on the same trajectory. Here's a question, guys. What's typically harder, the, the desert zone or the ice zone? The ice zone is usually harder, I'm going to say. Yeah, the desert zone is typically an intermediate zone. You, you get to the desert zone in Ragnarok Online right after you leave uh, Isludi. Oh, the ants. <laughs> you get the droplings and the ants right there. Whereas you go to Ice Dungeon, that shit's a little harder, all right? Think about it. And Tenaris was a late level zone, level 40. It was like so. a mid-level. At, at this mid -level, point, okay, it's, okay. Yeah, it's pretty early now, you know? <laughs> yeah, very early now. Are there any early level ice? Think of, think of the more pieces you've played. Are there any ice areas that are low level? Uh, uh yeah everquest the uh, barbarians start in uh ice okay, space yeah. only because you could everyone had different starting zones that you kind of had you had you had you had starting zone that was a desert too i'm sure so that's a little rougher yeah freeport was kind of a desert right from what i remember because you get tatooine before hoth so instead was uh ice is harder so yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. the dwarves start in a snow zone that's true everyone got starting zone so yeah so there you go so it's all roads lead to ragnarok ragnarok that's what i learned from this conversation. <laughs> we'll be our determinant Ragnarok sets the pace, as always, guys. Speaking of Ragnarok, Ragnarok recently released a clicker game, uh, which... Oh, that's I think fun. That's a fun story. Has, has yeah, let me hear that. It's a fun story. I like All right, this. lick me, baby. All right, let me find... So what level are you in clicker heroes? Oh, I'm sorry. Ragnarok Online clicker. You know, I'm launching yeah. the game right now. You should do a first look really? for that one. No, it's not It's not really a game. This wow. is literally the... Uh, look. Just show find. yourself macroing. It's worth it, dude. Let me give you guys. It's literally the same exact game as uh, Clicker Heroes. If you ever played that, it's just reskin, and it's made by the same guys, Playosaurus, that made uh, Clicker Heroes. It's of course, you know, they licensed the Gravity uh, Ragnarok game from it. And I I've been leaving it on. I have like, I don't know, I I'm on level 107. But these games is literally play forever. You keep transcending, and keep playing. It doesn't require your full attention. And the only reason I'm playing this is the Ragnarok theme. And I know you said earlier it does. You know, Blade is still the same franchise effect that, like, Ragnarok or WoW has. Obviously, it doesn't. But Ragnarok Clicker, it got me to play this game, right? Mm -hmm. Just for Ragnarok. 
So Isn't that weird that it can do that? So it's a question now whether franchise has cachet or not. Ready? Would you play a clicker version of it? <laughs> Ask you, if they had a Maple Story <laughs> clicker, I'd play it. I'd play Maple yeah, Story. Yeah, me clicker. too. 100%. Yeah. R RuneScape is doing it too. Oh, damn. I wouldn't. Really? I didn't play Maple Story though. Oh. Uh, you're not playing Ragnar or Clicker? No, I, I should though. I just, I just haven't had time. I've been just playing Overwatch. <laughs> Don't have time to play a game? <laughs> this oh is perfect for you. Guys, guys, just appreciate what Shu said for a moment. Oh, guys, I'm just so busy. I don't have enough time. I'm playing all this Overwatch. It's like, what do you say you don't have time? It's usually because of work, some other like real world drama, some moving. No, she was, she was too busy because she's playing Overwatch. I actually have work too. I've been, I've been all right, working. All right. It's just funny the way, you, the way you said that was like, all right, you know, I've been playing all this Overwatch. I got no time for anything else. We're starting, we're starting our game company, so I have to do some design stuff. Right. Oh, that's cool. Making hentai games, you know? Oh yeah, for the dream. Okay. The dream. Do I get do I get free samples? <laughs> uh you can uh you can be one of the voice actors and then you can get a free uh, sample. Alright. What enough. is it? Welcome to the NHK? Designing the hentai <laughs> <Yeah>. game? <laughs> <laughs> Solid anime. Random suggestion. Alright, any interesting shit of the week to cover? What are we looking? Oh, one small update I wanna throw on the in RuneScape. Remember that level nine 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 door? Okay. Uh the guy's gotten level nine nine nine, he's in got tibia. Through, in Tibia. And he's not telling anyone what's behind that door. Yep, we mentioned that last time. Yeah, it's just, we know for sure he's on 99 now and he went through. It just, he hasn't said what's behind it. Wait, really? He just went in and just like didn't say anything? What a dick. Yeah, he, he's keeping a secret. Would you do that, Omer? Would you do 100%. that? Would you go if, in? If, if I was in this position, no way would I tell anybody. They gotta earn what it. What do you gain? You gotta earn it. Yeah, you gotta grind like he did. You gotta put in the hours. That's my view. It, it's inside. It's just like a super like like orgy that you deserve today. It's like <laughs> you have reached level nine nine. You you deserve an orgy today. All right, that ad will make sense in that case. <laughs> right, I think we gotta link that uh, to make sense. <laughs> Otherwise, people are like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> all right, there is some context to what Shu has said. I'm looking out there right now to show on the stream. If you've watched in the past, you should know. But yeah, it's old War an ad that says you deserve an orgy today. It makes no sense whatsoever. But it's my favorite video game ad. It's the best. Alright, I mean, honestly, I agree with the statement. I do deserve one, so... It's the deserve, <laughs> it's, it's the deserve part. Like, if it just said, like, you can have an orgy today, that's like, whatever. But you deserve an orgy today. That's like... And it's today. It's not next week. It's not tomorrow. I so know, it's so perfect. Right. It's like the most perfect, like, ad. This is a real ad for War Tune, uh, a genuine ad. It really took the whole like sexualized ad thing that Ebony got the ball rolling on to the next level. <laughs> That's perfect world character. <laughs> quality, quality ad though, quality ad. Anyone else got anything over here? Do we have anything? I, I wanted to bring this up. I, I don't know if I have all my facts in a row, but someone had asked if we had any information about Star Citizen. And we do actually have some information about stars. Oh yeah, we do, and it's interesting because it also involves Shroud of the Avatar. Shroud of the Avatar and Star Citizen launched a cross promotional campaign, uh, which is kind of funny because they're two games that have both been crowdfunded and have been in uh, development purgatory for quite a long time. And this comes right after Richard Garriott tried selling his blood <laughs> on eBay, which was quickly removed. Um, so see, here's the question: you. Which of these, which of these studios is is more is going to get more and more, I guess, low for for begging for donations? I don't That's... know. Be able to sell your blood is like pretty, pretty funny. They, they, they actually did that. <laughs> are we going to get their poop soon? Maybe. I I, I think so. <laughs> I mean, an artist has done that before. An artist actually put their poop in a uh, like a small jar and sold it as like a piece of art. There was like forty jars, and they're worth like so much money today. I'm not even kidding. So it's, it's happened before. I believe it. Uh, basically, this was the first 250 players to purchase a $65 Star Citizen Aeronaut Helmet Starter Bundle. That's a mouthful. And the first 150 players to purchase a $400 Star Citizen Airship City Home Bundle get a, access to all in-game in -game items for both titles. So basically, if you buy something in one, you get everything in the other. So they kind of they've come into cahoots. Two games uh, that are never going to come out. Or just two games, out. yeah. Two games that will probably be in early access forever. For a while, for a while, for a while. And by a while, we mean forever. 
it's interesting. Shrenly, I haven't heard much news about Star Citizen. Otherwise, there actually was a conversation with Mark Hamill today about developing um, a little mini series that they're working on. Uh, some shenanigans. Uh, but Shroud of the Avatar, besides Richard Garriott's ridiculous marketing, really has been sta stale as well. I don't think any of us have played it mm. because it's been in, in a somewhat unfinished state for quite a while. All right, boys. I got an observation to make here. Please. An Let's hear it. An Altai observation of the week. Ready? Mis Mr. Observation. So we have a, we covered two interesting stories this week. One was Studio Wildcard of Arc. Uh, yes. They were unable to add monetization features to their game. But on the other side, we have games like Star Citizen and Shrouded Avatar that perfected monetization, but not the game aspect. <laughs> so they're good at monetizing, even though they have no game. They should really work together. Exactly. And you have Ark, which has a good game, but no monetization. That's actually really funny. <laughs> <laughs> they really do need to join forces. And what's, well, okay, yeah, funnier observation, too, is that Studio Wildcard is largely young guys that are making their way in the, in the industry, whereas Star Citizen and Shrouded Avatar are veterans who can't seem to make a game. So, uh, you know, the young blood, the young blood is what succeeds. Out with the old and with the new. I mean, you really have to give them props to the people behind Star Citizen, how, e how, like, how well they were able to monetize. Milk. Because if you remember, if you remember I think... Milk is the right word. Milk, milk. How well they were able to milk, right? They, uh, they basically sold these 2,500 ships. They, they got sold out within less than five minutes. Everything sold out. They had this promo. They sold 200 ships for $2,500 each. Guys, 200 ships for $2,500 each. Do the math. On a Do Star math. Citizen, a game that didn't come out yet, is in, <laughs> you know, going to be early off, or early access for a while, and they sold it in less than five minutes. This was last year. It just shows you the power of like just their monetization and their hype building machine. I think it shows you the power of faith. Yeah. The power of, I, I, I the only thing I can think that's analogous is like uh, a religion. That demands your money to get ahead, and I'm not going to name it. But there's quite a few of them, but that's what it feels <laughs> like: is uh, that you, you you pay your way into power. And it's perfectly acceptable because it gets you closer to your to your god, Richard Garriott or whoever. So, um, it's a little ridiculous. Yep, that's like 500k, by the way. The math was not that difficult. <laughs> but it's like gaining religion. <laughs> I mean, in a sense, I do think some games do try and, and or game companies, uh, purposefully or not, they put out, it, it's part of being a community, as you kind of have, it's almost like a religion. You worship the developer, the guy who puts his name out there. What's the guy behind Star Citizen again? Jacobs um, or something? So uh, does that make, like, Derek Smart, like, Satan or something? Derek Smart's Chris my Roberts, guy. Chris Roberts, Chris Roberts is the guy. Chris Roberts, Roberts, Chris Roberts. Right. I don't know why I forgot his name for a moment. <laughs> Derek, yeah. Derek Smart is like the Satan of their religion. <laughs> <laughs> he shall not be named. He shall not be named. And actually, <laughs> while I'm Googling this even further, a year ago there was, there was a, that, that, that sale. Somebody complained that, I'm not even joking, these $2,500 ships sold out in three seconds. I'm pissed off. And there's 200 comments of people saying, F this. I really wanted to buy this, but I couldn't do it. So what's crazy is not only did they sell those $2,500 ships so quickly, so many players felt like they missed out. <laughs> How did they do that? Somebody's got. I mean, they got some geniuses working there in the marketing what are we doing wrong, guys? machine. Yeah, what are we doing I want to sell imaginary ships for that much money. Did they? We're <laughs> in... oh, no, gonna start selling that's... heart emoticons. Like I question my life when they can just pull that off, and you know, here we are. We can't. <laughs> that's hella impressive. It really is. Props to them. Yeah, they got to figure it out. Uh, something that is also impressive is Wildstar's not dead. Uh, the predictions by the Korean investment, what bank. were they? They're, they're an investment bank that yep. Wildstar would be dead in what, eight months? By the end of this year? year. They said by the end of this year, they'll generate zero dollars in revenue for NC. Zero in revenue for NC Well, you know, they like, are, yeah. they're launching a new raid. Uh, so they are still continuing to push out content, which signals to me that they're doing okay. It's difficult to tell because on Steam charts, it's the game currently charts. has 607 players, but it's it's unclear how many people are actually playing the game through the independent client. However, the fact that they're still pushing out content either says to me that um, they are they are bleeding players and don't want anyone to know, or they actually are doing okay. They have a stable population. Does anyone anyone have an, an opinion uh, on that? We, we haven't played Wasp in a while. No, the insight is pretty clear. If you look at the Steam numbers, they're down. But again, the Steam numbers represent... I think the best way to look at it is the Steam numbers represent new players that jumped the game right. once it launched on Steam. Where many of the hardcore players who had the game installed already 
aren't going to reinstall on Steam just for the hell of it. A few of them might have done it just to boost the numbers a little bit, but most of them are still playing for their own client. So launching on Steam still gave them a boost of players. However, that boost has been waning. Uh, in June 11th, it had about 5,000 concurrent users, and that's been going steadily down since. So that prediction is still, I think, fair game, and they're predicting $0 in revenue for NCSoft on Wildstar by the end of the year. So it's it's... Unless unless the trend changes, there's only one way you can go. It can still uh, technically survive on a small core player base, but because it's a part of a bigger company like NCSoft, they may just shut it down, but that remains to be seen. I bet if Legion bombs, if Legion ends up being a total disaster, Wildstar will do okay, but if Legion no, is very successful... No, they, at this point, they don't on, overlap at all. All on, all on. I think so, because if people get burned out on Legion... Just imagine, I, don't th- I think Legion's going to be successful, right? Yes. But just imagine Legion was the worst thing that ever came out. Okay. Uh, and wow, if you would, I think people would look for other games. So yes, they would. Wildstar, would, Wildstar would, might be the one because it's would, another it would, Western. It would, it would give a small boost to every other game. I don't However, think Wildstar would get like. I, I think we just gonna be players. widely successful, so uh, we, we we shall see. Yeah, they're gonna make lots of money still. They're gonna make lots of money. But yeah, people aren't like a lot of people are have Wildstar as their backup game. <laughs> it might be Final Fantasy fourteen, but I don't think so. that's true. Wildstar Final Fantasy fourteen. Game. I mean, Final Fantasy fourteen has, has been doing. I think much, 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 much better than Wildstar. It's not even close. Uh, In fact, Final Fantasy XIV is about over 5,000 players on right now. Yeah, Gumball, so, I, I don't see your connection, but, you know, yeah. whatever. We're actually going to play soon, Omer. Um, oh, Final baby. Oh, yeah. I tried to play, but I freaking hate Japanese game systems because I, I couldn't recover my account. It was so stupid. It infuriates me in the back end of, like, these Japanese games. And I always had an issue with their, their login thing. I forgot my password. I go to recover it. I clicked the email link. After I already clicked my email link, then I got to answer the secret question, but it doesn't tell me what my secret question is. I got to select from a list of secret questions as the one I set when I first made an account like years ago, which I obviously forgot. Ugh. I'm just buying the um, game again. Yeah, wow. we're gonna we're gonna play we're gonna play in like uh, probably in like two days if you wanna. Why did they make me that? do that though? Why? It's pretty well, bad. <laughs> you can figure out your frustrations. Uh... Yeah. After the podcast, uh, I think this is a good time to wrap it up, boys. All right. We covered a good amount of content here. Um, check us out live next week if you are watching us on YouTube. Uh, Tuesdays at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on twitch.tv slash mmosdotcom. You didn't say com? Couldn't say com? Nope. Couldn't, couldn't say com. com. It sounds too close to a different word. See you. <laughs> That's why he didn't say it. We know why he didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> say your yeah. fairy wells. Uh, All right. See ya. Later, guys. Peace. Bye. Bye bye. Guys, I'm on